Hello everyone and welcome to your Glassnode video report for week 8 2022. So this week we're going to be looking at some of the headwinds that Bitcoin faces as it tries to recover from the lows. Now we're going to be looking particularly at the supply that's held at a loss. That's really going to be our focus point. And not only are we going to look at the supply that's at a loss as really the most likely to sell, we're also going to be looking at the cohorts of owners who actually own that supply. So are they long or are they short-term holders? So we're going to really dissect this and understand whether what is the potential energy of sell side, even though that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be sold, it's going to tell us a story about what is the probability of that. So that's what we're going to be assessing today. So as I mentioned, Bitcoin's really facing some headwinds. There's about 4.7 million coins that are currently held at a loss. It's obviously a non-trivial number. There's a large amount of supply. And those coins that are at an unrealized loss are the most likely to be sold. You may have been through this yourself where you've held coins that have gone immediately into the red after buying the dip that turned out to not be the dip. In many instances, they are the most likely coins for you to be selling. Now, the flip side of that is that, do you remember your cost basis from a year ago? I certainly don't. And this is what the long-term holder cohort really classifies. And statistically speaking, when we look at who is spending on a day-to-day -day basis or the most likely to react to volatility, it is typically the shorter term holders. They're people who've held their coins more recently, they're more recent buyers, and we're really gonna explore that concept of what is the probability of those sell side happening. So in order to achieve this, we're gonna look at two particular concepts. The first one we're gonna start with is on-chain demand, trying to assess what is the current outlay and what does it tell us about the overall cohort of users that are in Bitcoin today. And then we're going to go through that long and short term holder cohort analysis and look at their supply with a particular focus on the coins that they currently hold at a loss. And we're actually going to introduce a metric that's unreleased at this point in time. This is really from the Glassnode engine room, which is breaking down the URPD metric, which is kind of a, a, a realized price distribution, looking at where all the coins were last accumulated, but focused specifically and broken down into long-term, short-term, and exchange balances. So that'll be a, an interesting little metric that you haven't seen before. So let's jump into the charts and get started. Just before we do, please do give us a, a subscribe and a share, and let us know in the comments what you're enjoying about this content. Um, I will say thank you for all your feedback in terms of our light mode, dark mode. It is a heated debate. Um, I will say we've heard you, and we are going to be doing dark mode for most of our videos. However, for this one in particular, because we're going to be using the dashboard and there's a bit of in, intrinsic detail, we are going to be using light node for this one. So I apologize for your eyeballs, but uh, uh, do bear with me on that one. We will be doing dark mode for most of them, but we have heard your feedback. So here we are in our dashboard. And really, in terms of price action, we have been in this downtrend for some time now. It's coming up on three months since the all-time high. And this is actually an interesting data point because you can see that we're in this process of maybe recovering, maybe putting in a new low and trying to push higher, or is it actually forming somewhat of a bear flag? So in terms of overall price action, really we're at a period of indecision. Where is the market gonna go from here? So the first side of this equation we're gonna look at is the demand side. And I've got two metrics here. The first one is the number of active entities. You could substitute this for active addresses as well. Entity is a little bit more accurate, but it is a T3 metric, but you can achieve mostly the same information using active addresses. Now, what we can see here is really two different types of market structure. The first one is the bull market, which kind of stands out like a sore thumb. You can see more users coming in on every single price rally. The more the media talks about it, the more they hear about their friend getting in. And you can see 2019 had a miniature version. 2017 had these more, these larger peaks of new entities, new users, on each price rally. Now, the other side to it is what I've been calling the bear market activity channel. And you can see this through 2018, through most of 2019 and 20. And then here we are in 2021 and 2022, currently within this bear market channel. Now, there's two key observations here. The first one, aside from obviously pointing out the bear and the bull, the lower bound of this continues to rise. And this is even during very bearish territory. Now, this is speaking to a growing cohort of hodlers, people who are sticking around with Bitcoin, rain, hail, or shine, because during the most bearish periods, there is a growing user base. So that's certainly one observation that most likely there's only the hodlers that remain, but they are more in number every single time. Now, the other thing to note is that we're currently languishing to near the lower end of this. So in terms of the overall on-chain demand and new users coming into the system, 
it's a little bit lackluster. So that is the takeaway that we need to go with here. You can see just how dramatic this May sell-off back in 2021. In my opinion, that is really when this bear market kicked off, which is fascinating because it looks like we all-time hide within the bear, but you can see how dramatic the sell-off. We dropped down below March 2020 levels. So this really was a complete flush out of the user base and it's been struggling to recover. We've only just pulled up into this bear market channel and we're currently down at the lower end of it. So in terms of the on-chain activity, it's a little bit lackluster and it's not telling us overly great story in terms of the demand that's flowing in. So that's certainly one metric to pay attention to. Now, the other one is our non-zero address count. And I've looked at this on a 30-day chain, trying to look at what's happened over the last month. So in the background here, you can see this orange chart. That's just the number of non-zero addresses, which again is a fairly crude metric that's trying to look at just how many users are coming into the system. We can see during bull markets, it typically trends higher. As we came into May 2020, 2021, sorry, we had a selling out. This was a large flush out. People completely emptying their balances, completely spending their wallets and saying, just get me out. It took a number of months for this to really chop sideways and kind of bring those users back in, noting how low we were on the actual activity front. And really since October, it's been on this grind higher. Now, particularly over the last couple of days, there's been a little bit of a softening. So on the 30-day change, which is this blue curve you can see, everything above neutral is showing that there's overall growth. We're seeing an uptrend in overall users. You can see very, very high levels, over 1 million new addresses per month showing up on chain. So typically, that would correlate with a bull market. More users, more balances, more demand, typically a good sign. Following May 2021, we had a serious flush out. Here's neutral. We got down below 500,000 addresses being cleared out per month. So a very, very large flush out. And it's really been kind of oscillating around this neutral level. Some are coming in, then going out, coming in, going out. And since October, we had a slight influx of users. But over the last 30 days, we've essentially returned back to neutral. So again, it's a little bit of a softening out. And what we really want to pay attention to, does the non-zero address metric continue to trend higher? or as we continue to get this rolling over and a true softening of demand. These are certainly two metrics and ideas I'm paying attention to because that's going to show whether the demand side is starting to pick up, are people becoming more interested in Bitcoin, or is it really just the hodlers that remain, which certainly feels like it's the case right now. Now, in terms of profitability and where the coin supply is currently at, you can see here a huge amount of coins currently have a cost basis. This is the price when they last moved. We're currently here at this 30, uh, 38,400 candle. This is showing where the, where the current price is. And you can see all of these coins above are currently held at a loss. Conversely, these are all held in profit. Now, in terms of the actual magnitude of this, we're currently hovering here at 66% of all coins that are in profit. That's all of these ones which otherwise means that a third of all coins, 33%, are currently held at a loss, which is a non-trivial sum. This is a very, very significant amount of coins. You can see that we are at similar levels to where we were during the May, June, July sell-off, and granted at the absolute worst point. So we are now at a position that is as bad in terms of profitability on the network as we were back in the lows in 29,000 in July. Now, because we're trading at 38,000, and this was at 29,000, that means that a large portion of supply has got a cost basis that's now much, much higher. People have essentially traded it up. Someone has purchased it at a higher level up here in the 60,000s, in the 50,000s, and these folks are currently underwater on their positions. Now, one thing that I will highlight here before we move on to the next chart is a, well, it's, it's, there it is in the data, but we'd have to go back and unpick these. But during the May, June, July period last year, during this price correction, the amount of coins, it looked very similar to this. We had a big distribution of coins around the 50s and the 60,000s because there was about three months worth of a topping pattern all the way from February through to May. Now, following the sell-off in May, this thinned out very, very quickly. Lots of holders who bought the top panic sold and emptied their wallets and they were, had to be reaccumulated by the hodlers down in this consolidation range. So we saw a very rapid decline of all of these coins down to a lower level. Now, in the current market structure, we've been in this correction now for three months. So most people are aware that we've been in a downtrend. Most people are aware that it's a little bit bearish. And yet a large portion of these coins, even after three months, still haven't distributed to a lower level, which is a very interesting take. 
what we're seeing is less aggressive sell side coming from even people who bought the top. Now, if we now look at this as an unreleased metric where we're breaking down that same URPD, but we're looking at our long in blue and our short-term holders, uh, sorry, yes, and our short-term holders in red, and you can actually see the exchange balances here in gray, which you can see typically are more clustered. This is where exchanges are managing their wallets and moving their coins around, typically around the current price levels. Now, what's quite interesting is you can see the short-term holders hold coins up at 60,000 and 50,000 and 45,000. Now, bear in mind that short-term holders on a statistical basis are the most likely cohort to actually spend. They're the most likely ones to react to volatility, whether it's to the upside and they want to take quick profits or to the downside because they're panicking because the dip that they thought was the dip didn't turn out to be the dip. There was dips to come. So what we're seeing is that the short-term holders, even though they're most likely to sell, currently have large cost bases that are underwater, but they haven't yet sold them. And this is quite interesting to see. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't sell them. This is why when we talk about the current article, it's, it's Bitcoin faces some headwinds. As we get a price rally, are these short-term holders going to exit into whatever liquidity the market offers them? Do they just want to get their money back? This is what we've seen last week in the short-term holder SOPA, where any kind of rally higher, they're basically taking exit liquidity and just getting out. That's absolutely a risk. And they hold 2.6 million coins up here, so it's a non-trivial sum. But simultaneously, we've been in this correction, particularly these holders from 60,000, for a very, very long time, three months. And we've already established that it's most likely only the hodlers that remain. So the question that we're going to be looking at over the coming weeks is, are these short-term holders those that actually have the intention to become long-term holders? Are they coins that are held that were just recently purchased by long-term holders in the making? We have to really watch these coins as they migrate through the hodl waves, as they go up and down through age bands, and try and assess whether this is the case. So this is something that we're going to be paying attention to over the coming weeks, is are we really seeing coin maturation happening? And are these short-term holders just long-term holders in the making? Or in fact, are they going to create that overhead resistance as we try to get out of this? And that, you know, as the market tries to push through it, are they just going to become sell side that really keeps the market down? These are some of the questions we're going to be answering over the coming weeks, because it's quite a challenging thesis. And in such an uncertain time, the best we can really do, and this is for any analyst, is try and understand what does the information tell us, develop a thesis, and then try and find whether it's being invalidated or confirmed using data as it evolves. So that's really what on-chain analysis is about. Form the thesis, understand what we're looking for, and then follow the thesis to find out whether it works or whether the data is telling you that that thesis is wrong. That's really what we're trying to do here. So now what we're going to look at is some of the supply dynamics. And I have two sets of charts here. I've got our long-term holder supply, short-term holder supply. These are coins they have in their balance. They're unspent. It's basically what's in their reserves. And then I have the same for our long and short term, but these are the amount of those coins that are held at a loss. So we're really looking at what is their total supply and their behavior, and then how many of those coins are currently at a loss. So let's get started with that exploration. So a story about long-term holders. What we typically see, they're a fairly consistent bunch. They typically get to the all-time high of the previous cycle. This is around $20,000, which was the last all-time high. And you can see they were already well into distribution. Their total supply was in decline, and they really started selling all the way through to the top. And you can see that their sell side really slowed down as the market started to curl over. So again, this was, in, in, in hindsight, somewhat of a bearish sign. We're seeing less spending by long-term holders, and the market was failing to make really convincing all-time highs one after the other. So it was a softening of the overall demand profile. Now, as is also very common, when we move into more bearish trends, long-term holders really stop spending, and they move back into strong accumulation. Now, remember that these coins were accumulated five months ago, which is really what was accumulated during the first phase of this bull. We're just seeing it reflected five months later. But nevertheless, during the rally from the July $29,000 low up through September, up through October and November, you can see as we pulled into these all-time highs, like clockwork, long-term holders started spending their balance. But unlike what we saw during this all-time high, they didn't slow down. Note how they're spending actually slowed. The market wasn't strong enough to absorb their sell side, and rather than essentially selling the thing into oblivion, 
they realize that it wasn't quite time yet and they slowed down and they've actually moved back into that hodling and accumulation behavior. Now, bear in mind this little bump that you may see here, this is the 96,000 coins from Bitfinex that last moved in 2016, long-term holder coins that were then spent and you can see that they've jumped into the short-term holder cohort. So it shows you that those old coins which have changed hands, they've gone from the Bitfinex hack or the hackers to the Department of Justice. So we've actually seen a changing of hand. So the Department of Justice now has 96,000 short-term holder coins. Now you can see that this really tells a different story. This is enough market strength with long-term holders spending into it. They were taking profits all the way to the top. During the recent all-time high, they spent a little bit, but realized it wasn't quite time yet. And ever since they've actually been in hodling and accumulation mode, which is quite impressive. Given how severe this downtrend is, it's the same magnitude in terms of percentage basis for more than 50% of the lows as what we've seen. And it's been in effect for three months. So it's not like long-term holders are surprised that we're in a downtrend. This is not new information. And yet, even with all of this said, they seem to be fairly high conviction. They're hanging onto their supply. It's really quite remarkable. And we can see that our short-term holder supply is more or less the inverse of that. Long-term holders spend, they move to new short-term holder hands, and then most of the short-term holders leave during the correction when our on-chain activity collapsed, and those coins are migrating into long-term holder supply. There's an accumulation process that goes on, and they move from long-term in so from short-term, sorry, into long-term holder wallets. And you can see this very, very small growth. This is really showing that long-term holders aren't spending and becoming short-term, they're more or less hanging onto their coins. So there's obviously confluence between those two. So now we're gonna look at the amount of supply that's in a loss. And this actually tells a very different story to what we had back in July, which is really the closest reference point that we have. So note that for our long-term holders, their supply that's in a loss at the lows was about a million coins. Now, during September, there was a lot more that was in a loss. We had something around 1.5 million coins. And at the lows here at 33 and a half thousand, there was almost 3 million coins held at a loss by long-term holders. You can see that they have been increasingly at a loss all the way higher. Now, why is this? Well, this is primarily because all of the, long, all of the, the price action that you can see in this chart is going to capture up to September. This is long-term holders. So the left-hand side of this chart down to the September dip, this is 155 days ago. All of these, all the supply purchased during this uh, left-hand side of the chart are long-term holders. And everyone who put purchased after the dip in September is now a short-term holder. And you can see that the short-term holders, most of this price action, short of the dip down here at 33,000, most of this is now at a loss. So the short-term holders, almost everything that they own is currently at a loss. And it shows how severe that overall loss is. You can see on the proportion of supply, that's this light red chart. It's pretty much all of them. There's very, very few short-term holders that are in profit. Really, the only ones that are, are those that were fortunate enough to have bought the dip down here at 33 to 35,000. Now, in the long-term holder supply, we have a lot more that's relative to the previous dips. We have a lot more supply and a loss. Now, granted, these are also the cohort that's the least likely to spend. And given what they've already been through, they've seen this correction in May, they've seen the rally up to the all-time high in November, and then they've seen a second dip. They've been through quite a lot, and yet they're still hanging onto their coins. So really, even though there's a lot of them, they are the most likely not to spend. Now, the thesis would invert. It would be very bearish if these coins did start getting spent. If we start seeing long-term hold supply really softening in a very, very big way, it may well signal a loss of conviction from that cohort. And that's something that we ideally don't want to see. Now, the flip side is true for our short-term holders. During the May, June, July period, the amount of supply they held was almost 4 million coins at a loss. Very, very significant loss-making coins. And note that the price rally that came out of that, really, this downtrend was quite severe. And it shows how many coins were accumulated during this consolidation period. All of the coins that were purchased at the top were transferred to new owners during this consolidation. And as soon as the price was $1 above their new cost basis, the short-term holder supply in, in a loss declined rapidly. Now at the moment, there's actually a lot fewer coins, 2.9 million at the top and about 2.5 million at the moment, total coins held by short-term holders at a loss. 
It's a non-trivial sum. 2.5 million coins is a lot. And we have to really, the Bitcoin market's got to prove itself to get through that supply. This is the most likely supply to become sell side. However, note, there's less coins at a loss held by short-term holders than we had during this period. So it's very interesting. We're defending a similar level. However, it's the long-term holders who are actually at a larger proportion of loss at the moment. And you could argue that's probably more constructive because they've seen all of the volatility over the, over the last uh, six months. So on a proportional basis, it's not quite 50-50. It's about 55% of the loss-making coins are held by short-term holders. The remaining 45% are held by long-term holders, and it represents a much larger. Note that the total width of this light blue and red combined is much more than we had at the July dip, and most of that is because there were very few short-term holders at a loss. Here, there are far more. The long-term holder cost basis is much higher, and that's because six months ago or five months ago, September, we were talking about prices that were 40,000. They're roughly in the same range, so long-term holder cost basis is much higher at the moment. Now, what we're going to close on is a view of our short-term holder and our long-term holder profitability. So in terms of long-term holders, their NUPL, this is the net unrealized profit and loss. So in terms of overall market cap and compared to the Bitcoin market cap, how severe are short-term holder losses in dollar terms? Now, what we can see is that March 2020 was extremely severe. This was down over 70%. So 70% of the market cap was owned by short-term holders who were underwater at the bottom of the March 2020 dip. Pretty significant. Now, the July sell-off wasn't quite that bad, but it also wasn't good. Over half of the market cap was held by short-term holders at a loss. You can see that this was, again, a very, very severe sell-off in terms of overall um, uh, uh, short-term holders that were holding those underwater coins in maximum financial pain. Now, we didn't quite get down to that same level, 39% of the market cap at the lows, but note the power of this recovery. So between 33 and a half thousand and 44,000 or thereabouts, there's quite a bit of distribution that's happened from the top down to these lower levels. And that's generally bringing the average cost basis down. So there is that level of demand but simultaneously, we're not really seeing the user base growing at the moment, as we saw with the on-chain activity charts. And you can see that we've started to pull back on this metric. So overall, short-term holders are still at a risk. They own a large amount of supply that's at a loss. It's of a large dollar value. And we really have to see whether the market can push higher and actually get those coins back into a profit, which reduces their probability of being sold. And the longer that we're down here, the more likely investor sentiment gets more negative, the more likely any kind of relief rally creates that additional sell side. So it's going to be very interesting to observe and watch this spending behavior over the coming weeks, particularly with focus on these short-term holders. Now, in terms of the long-term holders, this is the spent output profit ratio. So it's very different to the short-term holder SOPA. Same construction, slightly different interpretation. And you can see that these are whole numbers with short-term holder and standard SOPA. You're looking at 1.1, 1.2, 0 0.9. That means that on average, profits of about 10, plus or minus 10, 20% are typical. What we're looking at with long-term holders, because Bitcoin has this wonderful property where the longer that you hold it, it typically goes much, much higher. We're seeing that these long-term holders that bought during 2020, we're seeing that the overall their profit multiples are 600, 800, 400%, much, much larger than what we see during the day-to-day -day spending behavior. It's a very, very different dynamic for the long-term holders. Now, what we can see is that at the top, they were realizing 800% profits, which is quite tidy. And what we can see is that during that decline, when we had the May, June, July sell-off, their profitability declined significantly. And this was largely driven by the fact that they stopped spending and moved back into accumulation mode. Overall, they were spending less and they were accumulating more. So the amount of coins they were spending was much, much lower. Now they spent a little bit as we came into the October and November all-time high, and this really speaks to their overall intelligence about the market. They sold a little bit, only up to about 250% profit, which again, not bad. And that was enough to put the top in, and we moved into this downtrend. And see how their spending slowed down quite dramatically. They're now only realizing about 46% profit, which is, you know, fairly, fairly modest when you look at the overall scope of what long-term holders have realized. So again, it's speaking to this relative strength by the long-term holder cohort. They are less likely to spend their coins right now. 
especially relative to the short-term holders, which kind of paints this picture that perhaps these long-term holder coins at a loss aren't really the major source of sell side at the moment. They've seen enough volatility, they're the least likely to spend, and they haven't spent so far. Mind you, let's pay attention to this and see whether that changes because obviously this data is always dynamic. Sentiment can shift. If anything changes that starts to decline this long-term holder supply, that would be a bear, even more bearish case. Short-term holders really are where we should be putting most of our folks at the moment until proven otherwise. And I would recommend if you check out our video from Friday last week where we actually go into a deep dive into what short-term holders are doing in the current environment. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. Just to give you a bit of a quick summary of what we've looked at today, the overall on-chain demand is pretty lackluster. We have not seen that same influx of people into the network. It's at the moment, it really does speak to being the hodler base that remains, and they are really the hodlers of last resort. So at the moment, they're the ones putting in support. That long-term holder conviction remains fairly high. I mean, it, we're not seeing them distributing their coins just yet. Um, they, it is a risk given how many of them are currently underwater but simultaneously, they are the statistically least likely cohort to spend. The short-term holder sell side, on the other hand, is really a challenge to be faced. And the longer that we languish down at these low prices, the more likely they're going to take any exit liquidity on the rally higher. So that really is the cohort to be paying attention to. And over the coming weeks, we're going to be really tracking things like our hodl waves and various maturation metrics to look at whether these short-term holders that we identified that still haven't spent with higher cost bases are they in fact long-term holders in the making? Are we going to see that overall flow of their coins moving up through into more and more senior bands and actually proving to us that there is in fact a thesis of long-term holders that haven't yet been identified? So do give us a share and subscribe. Really enjoy uh, making this content for you. Please let us know what you're enjoying in the comments and I will see you next week. Cheers.